I would argue, Sarah, that our industry has it has the appearance of having become more and more sophisticated over the last 30 odd years that I've been in the industry. And um, in actual fact, I think it's a kind of phony sophistication in which we've created all sorts of noise around what is a, a fairly straightforward activity of deploying real capital in the real world into projects that create wealth so investors can make money and people's living standards can rise. I'm Sarah Williamson, and this is Going Long with FCLT Global. On this show, you'll learn what it means to be long-term from the top minds in global business and investing. Leaders from companies and investment organizations join us to discuss how they are leading their teams for the long run on issues including capital allocation, risk management, climate change, and sustainability. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org. Welcome to FCLT Global's podcast, Going Long. Today, our guest is Stuart Dunbar, and Stuart is a partner and director of financial institutions at Bailey Gifford, where he's been since 2003. Bailey Gifford is one of the UK's leading independent investment management firms that has a unique partnership style. It's been a privately owned partnership since 1908 uh, with no external shareholders. And so Bailey Gifford has been able to focus solely on seeking out long-term investment returns. So Stuart, thank you for joining me today. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me. So one of the ways you've talked about long-term investing is, is the, a term that you've coined of actual investing. And uh, can you tell us what you, what you mean by actual investing and, and, and why does Bailey Gifford feel so strongly about actual investing? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess a quick history might be interesting here. We, we alighted on this kind of by accident. Um, if you go back a few years, um, we became quite, we observed, we became slightly worried that our industry was moving away from actively managed um, mandates. And we could understand why, because many investors are doing something very different than we're doing. And we became, you know, just slightly worried that, or we observed that, that we're not trying to do the same as a lot of other investors are doing. Our approach is different and fundamentally it's focused on fundamentals. It's about the real deployment of capital in the real world. And we, we sort of sat around for a bit, scratching our heads, really to try and explain to clients that we think we're doing something different than many other managers do. And the phrase actual investing sort of popped out of there somewhere. Um, I mean, the reason that we, 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 I think what really matters is it's just a catch all phrase that tries to reflect how we think investing ought to work, certainly for us. And what it's trying to capture is this back to basics approach. I mean, I would argue, Sarah, that our industry has it has the appearance of having become more and more sophisticated over the last 30 odd years that I've been in the industry. And um, in actual fact, I think it's a kind of phony sophistication in which we've created all sorts of noise around what is a, a fairly straightforward activity of deploying real capital in the real world into projects that create wealth. So investors can make money and people's living standards can rise. That's a very different thing than some other, I would argue probably the majority of the financial and investment industry is now doing, which is obsessing over share prices, looking at Bloomberg all day long, thinking about trends and quantitative approaches and alphas and betas and factor analysis. And, you know, all of this is just anathema to how we think we're interested in companies who are deploying capital. So the phrase actual investing is something that's come out of this and we hope it signifies that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I, I say to people, Sarah, often um, I'd, I would just love it if stock markets were only open for two hours on the last Thursday of every month. That would be enough. That's all the stock markets really should be for. But yet we don't think about it that way anymore. So it sounds like the way you're thinking about it is almost more like um, either private investing, um, or to your point, the way the, the way investing was done when, you know, people put their capital together to, to build the railroads across America or something like that, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, more than that. So is that, is that fair? And that's absolutely fair. I mean, there is this, what, what, what did stock markets start out trying to do is maturity transformation 
liquidity provision and risk sharing. And that's what they should still be for. And they have a very important role to play in that. Um, it's interesting. So our view in our firm, we invest in both private and public equities, mainly public, but we do some private. Um, and we don't think about it as a different task. The, the task of capital deployment is an underlying one. The structure that a company takes in terms of who its shareholders are and the liquidity that is available is a separate discussion around that. So, so you are right that um, if, if I have one minute to describe what we do to someone and they work in the industry and they know how to make a comparison, I will quite often say, just think of us as taking a private equity approach into public markets. Just because there's a price doesn't mean you've got to worry about it. And, you know, and so we talk about five year plus horizons and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I, th I think you're right. It's, 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 you know, the really difficult thing I think for many firms and investors to do is to ignore the, the noise that is created by having a stock market listing. So just because a company goes from private to public doesn't fundamentally change anything or shouldn't. The, the sad reality is it does change a lot, but you know, here's, here's a slightly odd analogy. Um, I think it's like we're sharing a playground with a load of unruly kids. Um, you don't have to go and play with the unruly kids. You can just stand at the side of the playground and watch them running around and bumping into each other. And then every now and then you might choose to participate a little bit. And I kind of think of it like that. We have to share a playground with a whole load of unruly kids, but we don't have to get involved in that game. I, I love your analogy. I, I also, although sometimes those unruly kids might run over and bump into you, right? And, and then you've then you got a problem. So, that, so if you think about that uh, analogy of, um, you know, what, what the other people are doing or what, uh, what percentage perhaps of the market is thinking like it's because what I find and is that most company um, management teams and actually many securities regulators think that people are investing the way you are, right? They think that they are looking at a company with starting with a blank piece of paper, looking at a company, understanding their business, deciding whether they think this company is going to be successful, hoping that the company is successful. But that's actually not the way most money is managed now. It's managed against an index. So you're either indexing directly or you're over or underweight um, uh, against an index or or people who are just, um, you know, not really trading companies, but trading um, dots on a screen. So, you know, when you think about the various other ways, what, what those unruly children in the playground are doing, um, is is that kind of the range of what they're doing? And, and how what? How, how many, how many, how many are there like you versus some of those other things? Yeah, that's a, that's a interesting way of thinking about it. I, I, I think you'd have to say, let me be clear. First off, I don't think there's only one way to go about this. We do it our way and I don't want to come across as like being incredibly critical of passive management. For instance, I think there's a good argument that passive is better than poor active if only because you know what you're getting and it's cheaper, you know, so that's sort of I'm trying to be even handed. Having said all that, so maybe, I don't know, in equity markets in particular, half of it maybe passively invested now in both institutional, if you're combining institutional and retail. Within the 50% that's left, I would argue that maybe 60 or 70% of that 50% is being managed in such a way consistent with client expectations that we do have this benchmark relative starting point. So you start with your benchmark and take risk around that. Tracking error, obviously, is what people like to refer to. Um, so you, you get then a pretty small amount of money that's actually being invested in how we would describe what investing should be. And that is essentially completely without regard for a benchmark. You know, so, so we, I mean, 20 years ago, we used to hold underweight positions in large sectors because that's what we had to do. And that was in the heyday of riskage tracking error and volatility. And I think it's taken us a number of years. We, 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 we didn't, we weren't kind of happy when we were there 20 years ago, but, but, but we have to do what clients were asking of us. It, I think it's taken a long time of increasing confidence on our part to, to bluntly come out and say, we don't believe in things like tracking error. Why would we want to own the least bad company in a sector? It doesn't make any sense. It just demonstrates that the system has got itself into a slightly strange position of doing things that aren't right. Um, one thing I would say is that, you know, we, we get into this, um, we, we have to guard against, how do we think about risk? We have to guard against hubris. We actually do run some strategies that have wide index relative parameters, but they're really wide. They're wide to the point where they're, they almost don't matter. 
And that's partly because clients want us to think that way, even though we think there are many flaws with that. But let's be realistic. Um, we, we, any, any investor can get carried away and, and having some heuristics or rules of thumb in place just to prevent that hubris from kicking in is not necessarily a bad thing, but typically we would take a different approach to, you know, how do we think about diversification? It wouldn't be index relative. So that's a long answer. The short answer is there's not many people really trying to invest these days, but I think that's rather than point the finger at the shortcomings of investors, it's the system we've built, which we, we really kind of have to think about changing. Yeah, it is the system we've built. And, and uh, yeah, that's very interesting. So when you think about investing in a company, you, um, you need to understand that company well. You need to have somebody who um, goes and kicks the tires, if you will. Can you um, give us an example of how you kind of really focus on those fun company fundamentals? Because I think we all know as humans, um, it, things go against you sometimes it's it's easy to it's easy to lose confidence so so how do you how do you how do you know the company well enough when when something's moving against you and maybe maybe some examples of of uh, some things where you've had to deal with that yes so I, I think our starting point here is working with companies not against companies so the idea that we don't know better than the people who are running the companies and and we come at it from a percept, an idea that, um, not that we know better than them or that we necessarily can offer advice, but that we might have a different and wider perspective. One of the things we would try to do is work out. So very important to us is, is management aligned with our horizons or management actually investing. And it comes back to this, who's actually doing the investing? I mean, this, this gets a little bit cute, but I don't think it's us. So we may be investment managers, but what we're really doing is we are supervising the process of managers within companies deploying capital, you know, and unless we're in, you know, primary markets in which case it's arguably a little bit different. So therefore there's this relationship building, um, a very important relationship building needs so that we can work with the management of companies. And then we don't invest in most companies because most companies in our view are not sufficiently investing to create their earnings of the future. So we love it when, you know, the, our typical company relative to index invests three or four times more in R&D than the average company does. Provided it's been thoughtfully done, we encourage management to do that. We don't like companies, conversely, where we think they're trying to manage quarterly earnings or under-investing or over-earning because we see that as something that's short-term and inconsistent with our horizon, even if the market might quite like that in the short run. So, you know, to give you an example, if you take... I'm almost reluctant to talk about it because we're so closely associated with it, but it's just a, such a great example. If you go back to our long-standing relationship with Tesla, um, you know, back in the day, Tesla may well have failed on numerous occasions because they were investing incredibly heavily in getting themselves to scale and very few investors took a long enough view or were perhaps imaginative enough to see where this could get to. And we have a real responsibility here where, you know, some of these companies need long-term shareholders in order to succeed. And I, I, the influence that we can have is to, to very often to try and work with management, in, in essence, to disregard the short-term responses that they might be getting from other shareholders who don't have the same alignment that we do. Um, something I've only worked out quite late in my career, I guess, is the importance to some companies of the investor relations function. Because I'd always thought, oh, you know what, they're just marketers, they're just trying to tell us some story to help the share price. Um, actually, in a really good investor relations function, what they do is they communicate well with shareholders in a way that creates permission for management to act in the long term. And I think there's a real nuance in there. So the reason I talk about that is this is, it's actually not about us fully getting into the nitty gritty of the, the, the execution of companies. Of course, we're interested in that as part of the governance function. We, 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 it's part of the discussions we have, but for us with our horizon, it's much more about what is the potential for this company? Things like what's its total addressable market? Is it actually trying to take advantage of that and are they investing for the future? And if they are, that's the sort of stuff that we can get quite comfortable with. You know, we're not, um, being generalist can be helpful, you know, so we're not experts in gene sequencing 
we probably are experts in the potential applications of gene sequencing and how that interacts with artificial intelligence, et cetera. And I think we're in quite a good position to try and put all that together and that informs our, our five to 10 year view. And that's really helpful. Um, so one of the projects that we've been working on is trying to define the, the characteristics or the qualities of long-term companies. In other words, what do you, what do you, what do you, uh, when you see this, then this indicates it's a long-term company. You just mentioned a couple. So, you know, um, companies that put three or four times more in R&D than somebody else, somebody who's not managing to the quarterly earning. Are there more on your list? What are, what are you know, are there, are there things, is it, you know, the, the uh, management owns a lot of the stock or is it, um, you know, what are, what are those other tells, if you will, that, 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 that this company is, is, is focused on the long-term when they make yeah, so besides that, I mean, the R&D is the obvious one, but it's a alignment of interest. So it is, where's management? I mean, it leads us to some um, less conventional views. For example, we, it's case by case, but we often favor companies that don't have one shareholder, one vote, because we quite like it when, when a founder needs capital and comes to markets to do that, but also needs to continue control of the company in order to execute on an ambition. You know, so we may want sunset causes or something, but, you know, we need to try and be very thoughtful about those kinds of things. Um, I guess the other, you know, we can look at longer term things like um, the employees that work in a business, you know, how wedded do they seem to be to staying in the business? Um, do they see the potential for it? So things like, you know, satisfaction of people that work there is actually not an irrelevant thing. It tells you something about how the business is being run um, and, and their ability to attract people. Um, I guess we look for, uh, uh, non-traditional ways of the people, companies that are willing to embrace uncertainty, to think about where might our technology be applied, where it's not being applied at the moment, you know, that real ambition to, to think laterally or obliquely as to where might this take us, you know, when we talk to companies, we don't ask them about quarterly earnings and, and that tells us quite a lot about how they, how they respond to that is quite interesting because, you know, very often they'll kind of, we'll have a discussion with them about their five or 10 year ambitions and, and they're slightly dumbfounded that we've asked them that. Um, some of them will have good answers and some of them won't have good answers. So it's, it's part, I guess my answer to your question is it's really this two way engagement with management and testing whether they're thinking about where they're going to be in five years and really disregarding where this quarter's earnings going to be. Yeah, that's really, that's really helpful. And it, it's, it always is surprising to me how many, uh, I, I was at a, a conference the other day and somebody who was later in his career said, said something like, I think I've been on, a, you know, 125 earnings calls. And, and I was thinking, why, you know, why, why, why have you, why have you done that? It's so it's those sorts of things. So that's really interesting. Um, so let's ask that same question about, um, investors, you know, obviously you, Bailey, you first got a particular structure and a particular mindset, but as you said, a few minutes ago, there's not just one way to manage money. So what are the characteristics when you look at I'm sure you look at, uh, if you, if you own a company, you probably know who else owns it. What are kind of the characteristics of the, of the people that, that you see, um, standing through those ups and downs or providing that capital when maybe, you know, the capital is running out the door versus what are the characteristics of the ones that, uh, are, are, are more short-term in their mindset? Yeah, that, that's right. So I think it's important to have partly the right structure and partly the right mindset as an investor to implement that long term as now we, we are incredibly fortunate here in our firm because we are a partnership and um there's nobody outside we have no outside shareholders everybody who turns up at work you know, all the partners who turn up at work every day are very aligned and and what that creates is um it, it, it the 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 ability to look through things like volatility and revenues so in, in our firm, it won't come as because we're very growthy. We've had this, you know, roller coaster of an experience in the last three years. Now that's been, you know, there are various different issues that raises with clients and making sure that clients are comfortable to come along with us. But in our own firm, what that means is revenues have had a massive spike and then come, you know, come heavily down from there. Now, if, if you were a, 
uh, if you had outside shareholders or possibly were a listed asset manager, it, it's still possible you can deal with this stuff. It comes back to my point about IR possibly. But um, but what you really want is to continue to invest in your firm through thick and thin. You know, we, we have spent decades trying to put together a really excellent investment team and train them in the way that we want them to invest and to create an atmosphere of trust, you know, where people can make long-term decisions and stick by them and not be afraid to make mistakes and all this sort of stuff. I think these are characteristics of good investment organizations. If we had, if we had to manage our firm to satisfy outside shareholders need for matching our costs to our revenues from one year to the next, you just have to dismantle your company every three years and then put it back together again. And I don't think that that is at all in the best interest of clients. So that's one thing. Now, to be very clear, th there's, no, there's no rule that says you can't do that in a listed company environment. It's just really hard to do, I think. And then other things I would point to in terms of um, what not having outside shareholders facilitates is things like, you know, we have no growth targets or sales targets for our own firm. It's not that we don't want to grow. I think growing is healthy for the people who work here and we want to have motivation and positivity, but it just doesn't make sense. Investment companies at some point must have to dilute the quality of their investments if they're forever taking in more assets. So while growth is not necessarily a bad thing, I don't think that having growth targets is consistent with putting your interests of your existing clients for it. So we just don't do that. We don't pay people commissions. We don't pay people to sell stuff. We, we do encourage people to get out there and spread our reputation and try and find clients that are aligned with how we think. That that then spills into things like capacity. So capacity management, I would I would highlight that long term thoughtful investors are likely to be thinking quite carefully about their own capacity and where they can deploy capital. Um, style, you, you know, we we're um, we we're growth investors that works sometimes. It doesn't work other times. The worst thing you can do is flip flop between the two. And you know, so so all of this. I suppose I suppose your question, Sarah, is well, okay, how does that translate into us having better relationships with companies and trying to get better outcomes for clients. I think it does because it's just, it's the stability we can offer. We are, we run our business in a way which allows us to take the long view. And that means that we're going to take the long view on the companies we invest in. We're not going to run away at the first sign of, um, you know, margin being squeezed or poor quarterly results. We're going to look at companies in the same way that we look at our own, which is, are you building long-term value, long-term wealth? And can we see a path to, is, is that worthwhile? Are you going to have decent margins? And can we see a path to you getting there? And if we can, you know, that, that's great. We'll hang in there. And then the second part of your question, I guess, is when do we, when do we give up on that? So it's not, it's not for us. It's not because the price went up and we've made some money. It's, it's do we see this story coming towards an end where its prospects for future growth in the next five years are less than they have been in the past? And, and normally, normally we sell companies because we find better opportunities, not because they've suddenly gone from good companies to bad companies. That makes that that makes that makes a lot of sense. There's of course there's, there's always that prioritization. That's interesting. Um, so you've talked a lot about long-term value creation, and and you know parts of that could be called sustainability or even ESG factors, how do you, how do you bake those things into looking at a company? If you're thinking about, um, their competitive position over the next five years, for example, is that, is that just part of the analysis? Is that different? How do you think about that? It, it is, it is part of the analysis. So I think you have to split this question into two parts and, and answer it firstly, in regard to the vast majority of our clients who want us to invest as well as we can for investment returns in the long term. So let's. You know, there's kind of a danger. Everyone wants to talk about ESG these days as if it's a separate discussion than investing well. And even where your clients have not given you some secondary objective, and we can come to that. Some of our clients have asked us to do specific things. But even for the, the, the mainstream client base, making the best investment decisions we can means taking into account E, S, and G factors where we believe they're material to the likely outcome and the likely success of a company. So it's not new, but what, what has changed, and I'd be the first to say, we've had to learn a lot and add resource. The E and the S in particular, I think have become far more central to some investment discussions. And, and 
our thesis there is we are in a world where individuals care about this stuff. So they make personal decisions, which I think actually are starting to be influenced by greed and considerations. I mean, as an aside, Sarah, I, I interviewed um, some of the youngsters that come and join our firm on the client side, and I asked them, um, what sort of personal purchasing decisions do you make? And do you incorporate, you know, ESG is a lot of nonsense. Nobody actually thinks about it when they're in the supermarket. Um, and, and I think that that's changed in recent years. I think consumers are starting to try to make more responsible purchasing decisions. If we can observe that happening, that clearly has consequences for companies that, that don't manage their reputations well or are actually doing things that consumers are not going to find acceptable. Those same consumers are electing politicians with the same set, you know, with, with similar beliefs. The politicians enact regulations that, that force companies to think harder about social and environmental issues. So again, it, it, almost regardless of what your personal beliefs are with regard to things like climate change, if the regulatory environment is becoming more and more tight, we have to incorporate considerations of that simply into our assessment of the likely financial success of a company. So I think, so that's a, that's a, a wholly an integration argument. Um, I think that's how we should all think about this. ESG is not supposed to be a label. It's a shorthand for certain investment factors that we now have to consider more than we used to. That's how I would think about that. And then if, if, if I go on a little bit longer, that you then have the second set of clients who actually want us to go a little bit further than that. We want you to have a carbon footprint target. We want you to exclude certain sectors, or maybe we want you to have a very tightly defined engagement program for improvement with some of these companies that are remitting. And, you know, we're, we're quite happy to do that too, because I think, I think, um, the, there are different approaches to responsible investing, if you want to call it that. I think we have to guard against doing anything which might be undermining to investment returns. At some point, that becomes quite a difficult trade-off. But for us, um, sort of embracing these different approaches, trying to work with clients, describe with them that this is a process of change, not a snapshot. Um, you know, we can all kind of get to a decent place here where we're focused on investment outcomes, but we are reflecting the changing environment in the broadest sense in which we have to invest. So that, you know, so that, that I guess is a long way of agreeing with you, which is this, this is just trying to be the best investors we can and anticipating the changes in societal behavior that are going to impact companies. And, and are the companies in general interested in that conversation now? I mean, I think what we're, what we've seen in the U S but I think also, uh, in other places is a little bit of this pattern from companies or leaders having an ambition, oh, let, we'll be net zero by this date or, or we'll do these sorts of things almost as an aspiration, like we're going to be the best company in our industry. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't tight. It was, it was an aspiration. And then people saying, well, okay, now I want to see your plan for how you're going to do that and sort of try to hold people, you know, is, is this real? And then sometimes in some places, people then backing off of those things because they, um, they, you know, they, they're, they're getting, they're getting pressure on the other side. And, and a lot of companies that we talk to being um, challenged about, well, how, how hard do I lean into this? Some of our investors don't want us to. So, so how do you, how do you, how do you see the companies reacting? I'm sure it, it varies, but can you characterize that for us? Yeah, it, 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 it does. But for us, we're certainly, I, I think we get fairly positive responses to it because we are not on some sort of a ideological crusade. We, we talk to companies about how do you see this impacting the success of your business on a five to 10 year time frame? And that can be a number of things. It can be. Just tell us about your emissions so that we can understand what risks you might be running. Um, it might be, are you as a company investing in the vast opportunity, which is coming into view in terms of, you know, if we have to decarbonize the economy, um, and electrify the economy, then that's, that's a gigantic investment opportunity. Are you thinking for, obviously not for every company, but for some companies, are you thinking about how you can take advantage? Can you be a solutions provider into this changing environment? And then there are factors like, um, this is looser, but can you attract 
really high quality people to come and work in your business if they care about this stuff and they don't think that you do. So, so it, 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 this very much can we think through the consequences of how this could be negative for your business? Quite a, you know, we, there's a whole other conversation to be had about people's individual beliefs and what do we all want to do to tackle climate change? But I think we have to remember that companies have shareholders and we have clients. So we, we have to sort of try and keep it, uh, uh, unless otherwise agreed with our clients, we have to try and keep it very focused on how is this material to outcomes for your business. But I do think, back to this point, we really have to recognize that it is becoming more material. I, I, I don't think it, there are not that many companies in which you can just dismiss these E and S issues as simply not relevant. There might be some, but I don't think there's many. And then you get into this whole different discussion about, um, I mentioned earlier about it, it's a process. I mean, again, I like to say, some people come to us and say, you know, can I have a low carbon portfolio? And we'll say, well, you can, but I can make you a portfolio which has 10% of index carbon footprint, which is doing nothing to tackle climate change. Is that really what you want? Um, so it's just, again, trying to, trying to help people to understand that these issues are all related to each other, are all integrated, but are impactful at the company level as well. And how do you think this um, uh, question is evolving globally? And you have clients, I'm sure, around the world. Do you feel like there's a very different conversation in the U.S. than the rest of the world? Is Europe really different than the rest of the world? Or is there a, is there a, is there a way to characterize that? Because I feel like that's where sometimes we get a little bit, you know, out of sync in different regions and you see a lot of them. So yeah, we, I, I would say yes, different regions are out of sync, but it's a result of the different, I guess, different interpretations of what people want, what clients want, what fiduciary duty means. I don't think anyone's trying to do anything, which is, it's almost like we're creating sides here. If, if we all, if we kind of focus on the central task here, which is, this is still about creating investment returns to pay pensioners or whoever it may be. Um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think we're different in that regard. We just have slightly different, well, actually quite significantly different views in exactly what the different influences are at this point in time. And, and then you do have, I mean, I don't think it's going to come as any great revelation to say that, um, I would say Australia and Europe seem to be more, I was going to say more advanced, but I'm not even sure that's the right phrase. Just it, it's more surface of mind as to how we incorporate ESG factors, but you've got to guard against, you know, so, so this would be too boring for your listeners. So I won't, I won't say much about it, but when you look at the SFDR regulations in Europe, for example, they're well-intentioned, but are they really serving that purpose of, you know, directing capital where it needs to be? And is that consistent with making the best investments we can? I think it is, but it becomes quite complicated. So I'm very reluctant to say, you know, there's not a good, bad thing going on here. There are different entities and different organizations in different contexts um, who see this playing out differently. I mean, I can understand to a degree the sort of anti-ESG commentary that is starting to become more common but it's important to understand what that is. It's just a desire to say, don't express an ideology through with, with someone else's money. Um, I don't think that's an unreasonable position to take. The important thing is we, we have a proper conversation about that's not what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to invest in a world in which the environment is changing. And, and that, that is common to all of this. I think I, that's a, that's a good watchword. Don't express an ideology with someone else's money. You know. Well, and, and you know, do we forget that in our industry? I, we we try not to, but it, I guess it's all too easy. Right. That's right. That's right. Um, so the the last question I will ask you is: you you all are known for looking far into the future and thinking about you know what what the world might be like in five or ten years. Are there things that you're thinking that you're really excited about that maybe are, I mean, maybe risk as well, but either risks or opportunities that are um, on that long-term edge that are, that are not on the front page of the newspaper today, but what, what are the things that, that, that you're excited about in that, in that longer term time frame? Yeah, there's probably, I mean, three things immediately spring to mind that, so, so I get that by, by way of introduction, I think that the, um, the growth opportunities of the next 10 years may well be significantly different to those of the past 10. So, I think we've had this incredible 
set of circumstances in which you've got incredibly very cheap money, digital platform type businesses that can roll out at very low incremental costs everywhere all at once. And you've, so you've had this incredible growth in some of these companies that we were clever enough or lucky enough to be quite early investors in. Um, those have not suddenly become terrible companies, but I think, you know, their growth is near the end than the beginning now. The next stage of growth is going to come from the, the way we think about this is what's becoming possible that wasn't possible five years ago. And that's a combination of technological advancement, rethinking business models, changes in people's behaviors and the confluence of different things. So with all that, so, so what that means is we think um, there are interesting opportunities. I think they may well be more capital intensive in the next 10 years than they have been in the past 10. And with all that as introduction, what I'm talking about here is things like innovations in healthcare. Um, you know, so we, we, again, I'm sure for, for your listeners, these, these things won't come as new, but it's the, the confluence of artificial intelligence and gene sequencing and our ability to manipulate genes and to truly understand disease. Um, you know, we'll have seen, we're recording this a week after Grail came out and said, you know, we, we, the big, it's a big thing here in the UK, certainly about, you know, now we can, we can fairly accurately diagnose cancers at an earlier stage. That's a big, big deal. Um, it'll be some years before fruition. And that comes back to this capital intensity point. We, we, these are things in which you can't be careless. Big drug trials cost a lot of money. Um, R and D costs a lot of money in the background. So these are more capital intensive industries, but Look at the background to this. We have got a huge demographic headwind. It, it seems implausible that countries just spend more and more and more percentage of GDP on health. We have to find efficient ways to do it, and the technologies are there. So that's one area that we are finding genuinely fascinating, and I think that I think that will turn on its head in the next ten years. There will be a whole lot of great investments to be made, and and big threats to big incumbents. So that's one area. The other one we touched on, so I won't say too much about it, is this energy revolution. Um, you know, there's a long way to go. We, we don't, we're not going to become carbon free tomorrow. So there's, it, it becomes actually quite a challenging thought process, but nonetheless, there are huge opportunities out there in terms of the electrification of the economy, but also things like, you know, I, I guess hydrogen has a role to play as technology stands. We're not going to be flying in long haul electric airplanes, for example. So. There's lots there, and it's quite a well-known one, but we're at the beginning, not at the end, you know, and then we are investing a whole lot of money at the moment in the more investable parts of that, like battery manufacturers and not so much solar panel manufacturers, which is perhaps a bit of a commodity, but the, around the periphery of that, things like software and, and, and clever technology that make them work a bit better. And then the third area, which I think is... um fascinating and still quite early is payment systems and, and the financial system at large. You know, banks are, we, we don't invest much money in banks because we think they are ripe for disruption. They, they make a whole lot of money on relatively, what are now relatively straightforward transactions like foreign currency and lending and obvious things in which there are multiple startups and, and not quite big companies who sit in the background of online shops and they facilitate multi-currency, multi-format payments, and it's all absolutely painless. And these are, so it's, I mean, in some way, these are companies, we've kind of seen the companies that are visible. So now everyone knows about Amazon and I guess even Moderna, everyone knows about Moderna now. Um, there are companies that people haven't heard of now, like, like software companies that provide security for a cloud-based approach to your systems, for example, Cloudflare. Um, you know, there are others, I guess Shopify is becoming better known, but sitting behind Shopify, you get companies, the Dutch company called Adyen, which runs all the payment systems in the background. So it's almost, I think we're now com companies you haven't heard of, but that facilitate the infrastructure within a changing world. Um, there's a whole lot of that out there. And, um, I guess I won't go any on any longer, but the, these are some of the, uh, there's some, uh, it, it, we, I, I, we, we get asked, what's the, um, do, you're a growth investor. Or can you invest well in a non-growth environment? That's a big one at the moment because people perceive that, you know, growth is going to be much more challenged and that's probably a fair comment. Um, you know, my answer to that is it, it, it doesn't matter that much. Some companies thrive in all conditions. You don't need GDP growth to run behind that. So, so. 
what I'm really saying is I have rarely seen a world in which there is so much potential disruption in the next 10 years. And we don't know exactly how it will play out. Of course we don't. But, um, you know, these trends are pretty, pretty much definite. And what we have to figure out is how do we be on the right side of that on a five, 10 year view. Yeah, well, that, that's fascinating. It is that long-term view and that long-term value creation and that the sort of those companies that are investing now, and of course, some of them will get it wrong, but that are, that are innovating in technology, business model, whatever, whatever it may be. I mean, I think that's obviously at focusing cap on the long-term is what, what gets us really excited because those things, to your point, have real, real impact on, on communities and people's lives. Uh, as yeah. Well. And it might be, if you, if you go back to where we started on this, I guess, yeah. um, when, when we think about the world in this way, it's amazing what doesn't matter. What doesn't matter. If you think a company can grow a hundred times in the next 10 years and okay, that's rare, but that can happen. Um, does it really matter if it's $2 or $2.50 today? Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of the whole point, isn't it? it? It just doesn't look at the potential. Remember that asymmetry is a thing, um, except uncertainty and, um, and try and find the few that can really work and then nobody's going to. Nobody's going to get too worried about the fact. You know, the, 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 the big mistake you can make is to not buy a company in its very early stages because it's already doubled. Nobody ever talks about that. That's a way bigger mistake, potentially way bigger mistake than buying something that doesn't work out. Yes, or yeah, or, or the, the people who, who sell it because it's doubled, right? And it's, and it's, exactly. And, and and it's got a long, long, long way to go. Right. And that's, that, that's, that's it. And, and, term behavior. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, so we, you know, so we don't have price targets, for example, for that very reason. You know, not everybody wants to invest this way, but for us, it's if if you're if you're looking for rapid, prolonged growth, or even it doesn't even have to be rapid, just prolonged growth that compounds through, and it makes your in point a, a, a lot. You know, you don't need to try and guess what the market's going to do. You just say, whatever. In ten years' time, this has got the potential to be absolutely wonderful. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you for your insight. Thank you for your thinking about, you know, re really that that long-term mindset, that thinking about how do we allocate capital in a true way. You've given us a, a lot to think about today. So, um, and thank you for your uh, in, in support and involvement in FCLT. You're, you're, uh, you're pushing our thinking, which we really appreciate. Thank you. Yeah, great. We're, 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 big, we're big fans. So for, for anyone, FCLT or other, who are listening to this, um, why are we involved? I think it's really important that we try and push things. You know, we it's not the end of the world. We do okay as an industry. The world does okay. It grows, but we can make it better. And I, and I think, you know, discussions like this maybe help a little bit. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Going Long with FCLT Global. Be sure to hit subscribe to get new episodes every other Monday. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org.